to another program on spirituality. I'm indeed thrilled to have as my guest today the three provincials of Our Lady of Guadalupe Franciscan province here in the Southwest that are carrying on the tradition of the original Spanish Franciscans who brought Christianity to this part of the world over 400 years ago. So you're in for a treat today. Uh, on my immediate left is Father Larry Dunham, the current provincial and his predecessor, Father Gilbert Schneider, and the very first provincial, Father Meldon Hickey. Welcome to all of you. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. It's great to have you. I've been hoping to do this for a long time. I want to uh, thank my former rector, uh, Father Crispin Butts, who uh, was instrumental in uh, bringing this all together. And uh, I know for all you people out there, particularly in the Southwest, are used to seeing the men in brown. Uh, it's going to be a welcome treat for you. But today it's a special treat because we're going to honor the founding of this brand new province. Only how many years? 20 years, Bill. 20 years. Seems like yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> and all these fellows originally came out of uh, St. John the Baptist province in Cincinnati, Ohio, uh, but have been serving uh, faithfully here in the Southwest for, all, for many, many years. So welcome to all of you again. Thank you again. Uh, who would like to lead off and tell people out there who don't know who Francis was or who Franciscans are, just to give a little background for those people who just haven't found him yet? Well, probably all three of us have our own uh, particular uh, take on, on Francis. Uh, he touches each of us in a, in a different way, and yet there's some great similarities in the way Francis uh, calls each of us. Uh, we, um, I think we were all taken with Francis being so um, such a, a wonderful imitator of our Lord, but very down to earth, very, very human. Um, he, he was a contemplative on the one side, but on the other side, he, he was very much a, a man of the people doing for others uh, with the, the least, the last, and the lost, uh, you know, he particularly sought out. He was truly a gospel, a gospel man, a very balanced man. He was not a religious fanatic. He was very balanced, and the picture you get of Francis is totally balanced and totally integrated uh, man, uh, absolutely in love with his God and in love with God's people and all of God's creation. And I think that in some way, you know, has spoke, speaks to all of us. He, he was a great romantic uh, and yet a great realist, too. Um, and he lived in Italy during what time frame? He lived in, in Italy in the early 1200s um, uh, from a town of Assisi. Uh, that still is very, very um, visited, well visited these days. It's up on the, the part that Francis lived in is still up on top of a, a mountain and very, very preserved, um, uh, very medieval style uh, city in, of his time and uh, still exudes the, uh, the uh, aroma of Francis, mm -hmm. the peace of uh, Francis, the romanticism of Francis, and, and many people still, Franciscans, but all Franciscans, men, women, uh, uh, make pilgrimages to, to Assisi because it's a place of peace and it's, it's, it's a place of great spirit. So. And the Holy Father, Pope John Paul II, used it recently as a, as a center for peace activities through other denominations and other religions around the world, didn't he? He got a lot of... He did, back in the 1990s, and I don't remember the specific year, but on the Feast of St. Francis, he called uh, together, invited all religious leaders of all religious faiths, mm -hmm. uh, men and women of of peace and of love together in Assisi as a place of peace and love and justice and uh, to meet in the uh, uh, the place where Francis began the Portiuncola the little portion the little chapel that was the mm -hmm. first uh, chapel of the of the order of the Franciscan order mm -hmm. and all these men and women of, of every religion from every culture and language you know came together on the feast of St. Francis the man of peace uh, to, to be men and women of peace mm -hmm. and to proclaim their oneness in that that vision so mm -hmm. I want to point out that Father Larry is the current provincial and that means he's the head servant of the servants so he serves all the other servants and yeah. his immediate predecessor Father Gilbert welcome Father Gilbert thank you uh, what can you tell us about how did you become a Franciscan 
or how were you drawn in? <clears throat> well, I, I have an, I had an uncle who was a prior also in Cincinnati province, and I think that had a lot to do with it. And uh, sisters in the grade school uh, encouraging us to uh, to look at the priesthood, but then of course I was swayed toward the Franciscans because of my my uncle, mm -hmm. and I, I believe that was one of the founding uh, things that, that brought me to the friars. What are the difference between, uh, can, maybe you can explain the difference between a, uh, a religious priest and a, perhaps a diocesan priest. What's, their, what's the difference in their lives typically? Well, I guess the main difference is we live in community. We follow the, uh, the rule of St. Francis, which calls us to live in community and to minister as a fraternal uh, community uh, toward uh, whatever ministry we uh, undertake. Mm -hmm. We do it as a community, not just as individuals. And so I think, I guess that would be the main difference that we are uh, living in community and ministering as a uh, community, evangelical fraternity, we call it. And that's, uh, that's one of the big differences. So you're typically not out there alone. Like these days, you're often lucky to have a, a, a Dawson priest, uh, maybe manning a parish somewhere or several parishes. At least you guys have a community and make it a part of your spiritual life. Then. Right. Even if in, one, in rare cases a person might minister uh, individually, he still is part of a community mm -hmm. and returns to that community whenever possible. Okay. Father Meldon, I'm eager to get you in here because you were the very first provincial of Our Lady of Guadalupe, and I'm sure there were many challenges for you in your career. Uh, how did you get started in the Franciscan Order? Well, first of all, I came from a very great town called St. Bernard, Ohio. There were 70 boys ordained priests in that parish. 69 of them were Franciscans. So I went to a Franciscan high school and certainly the only thing I was drawn to was the Franciscans. I came out here to Santa Fe in 1952. So I've been out here in the Southwest since 1952. <clears throat> I think one thing about the Franciscans and St. Francis that our provincial did not mention was the creativity of St. Francis. I mean, not only the Christmas crib, the way of the cross, but I think the Franciscans have done that out here in the Southwest, that they've shown such tremendous creativity working with the Native American people, with the Hispanic people. And I think the very fact that St. Francis was such a creative person that it uh, resounds to the whole spirit of the Southwest, huh? So I think, in a certain sense, the whole Southwestern is Franciscan in spirit, I think. Yeah. Would somebody like to explain the history and why was it that it was Franciscans who brought the faith to this part of the world? Uh, I can remember hearing the Holy Father flying on his way to Arizona, I don't know how many years ago that was, Pope John Paul II, he addressed the people of New Mexico and he reminded us that the Franciscans had brought the faith even before the pilgrims landed on Plymouth Rock. There were Franciscans in the forefront of that movement. Who would like to speak to that? Um, I think I can speak a little to that, that the, the, the Franciscans uh, as a missionary order uh, uh, came with the Spanish in their expeditions, their various expeditions here to the New World. And already in the, you know, in the 1500s, by the year 1539, I believe, a, a, a friar we've all heard of, Marcus de Nisa, was wandering around the Southwest um, lost. Um, we were just talking, he must have been probably a thorn in the side of his provincial, but uh, he somehow had, had gotten lost and wandered around what is present day New Mexico, Arizona, and then just a couple years later in the Coronado expedition, when Coronado came into the American Southwest, Marcos de Nisa was again with him as, with, as were other friars. So, so when the white man first came into this area of the American Southwest, Franciscans were, were, were part of that. And as a missionary order had, had made sure that they would be with, the, uh, with all the expeditions that, that came through. And finally, by the end of the 1500s, around 1598 or so, permanent uh, establishments were being made by the Spanish in these areas, and that certainly included the Franciscans. The Franciscans were establishing uh, uh, permanent residence and permanent missions mm -hmm. by by 1598. So mm -hmm. when you compare that to the to our to the English history yeah. on the Eastern Seaboard, uh, it's it's really quite amazing, and many people don't know this. Uh, it's truly amazing. It's truly, and and so you guys are really the primary uh, source for Christianity amongst uh, Native Americans, I would imagine, certainly in this part of the world. 
and you continue to do that to this day. What is that like? How is it? How do you feel when you're when you're working with people of a different culture and a different background, but but uh, carrying on that tradition with Native Americans? Especially you guys in Arizona. I guess that's what you're doing full time, right? Right. I think, in a way, as Father Lair was explaining, it's maybe also providential that the uh, Franciscan spirituality came to the Southwest because it fits so beautifully with the spirituality that is already here uh, with the Native American spirituality. As you know, St. Francis is known for the Canticle, Brother, Son, Sister, Moon, a movie by the same title. Uh, so nature was very important to Francis and uh, very practical and creative, as Father Meldon said. Um, and so I think it fits very well with the spirituality of the native people, and it's very attractive to them that, uh, mm -hmm. that uh, the Lord comes to them through nature as their own spirituality has led them to understand and believe. So that, I think, is a very good basis uh, for uh, uh, joining together the two spiritualities and bringing them together. Was it also helpful in the melding of the original Spanish and the Native American? I imagine the Franciscans would often find themselves as a mediator, probably, in disputes and that sort of thing, because the church would be there uh, bringing Christ's values into the two cultures, and now, now the other culture that we're all part of that came in. It, it seems to me that that would be another major role. Is that your experience, Father Mellon? That's for certain, yeah. Are you no, called on in that way? I worked with the Pueblo people for 30 years, and just being a Franciscan, of course, you are more or less accepted into the Pueblo because that's part of their culture now. Uh, the Franciscan culture and the Christian culture and the Native American culture sort of blend it together. The Franciscans being very creative to accept the values and visions of the Native people it does make a little difference. Once you're there, you're accepted, but until they get to know you, that the, you are uh, open to their way of life, you're accepted but not really part of them until you're there four, five, six, seven years. Uh, it's true though the Franciscans did have to confront the Spanish governors on occasions to uh, justify certain things in the way things were going. Mm -hmm. Now, all three of you men are priests, so you're providing sacramental services for them. What challenges does it have for you, and what, what were you trained to do in relation, in, in terms of dealing with people from other, other cultures or backgrounds, and particularly, you know, teaching about baptism and then the other, the other sacraments? And, and I imagine the sacrament reconciliation does take a, a special sense to be able to respond to their needs. You're smiling, Father. Well, I, you're making me think of a story of how I okay. ended up here in the Southwest, which was because of Father Melton, as a matter of fact. And, and uh, I was studying, and uh, I was an associate pastor in Emporia, Kansas, and I was going to, uh, taking graduate courses at Kansas State Teachers College. And I was just about to get my master's degree when I get a call from Father Melden, who was on the, the provincial, which was Cincinnati at the time, the Cincinnati Provincial Board. He was a definite representing the Southwest, a, uh, a counselor. And he called up and he says, you know, have you ever thought of the Southwest? And I went, no. <laughs> <laughs> and he says, uh, would you, uh, I, I, when I first came as a young priest, Father Melden is speaking, he says, I, I, I was assigned to the cathedral to care for Santa Clara, San Ildefonso, and Tezuque Pueblos. And uh, I'd like you to consider this. And I said, I, I really don't want to consider this. I'm not interested in coming to the Southwest. And, and one of the reasons that I was trying to stall him, because I, I wanted to go into teaching, and I did not want to go to the Southwest. And I tried to stall him to say, I don't know anything about Native American peoples, their culture, their spirituality, their history. I mean, I, I just don't. I want to be honest. And, he's, and I never forget that he told me, he says, Perhaps that will be the best thing that you can bring them is, is to learn from them, that you don't bring preconceived ideas, how it should be. You come and learn from them. You come and, and see what love and spirituality that they already have in their culture that's already there. And let that touch you and uh, let that lift you up, make you even a better friar and a, and a better priest. So he said, just come with a blank slate and let them write on it. Boy. And uh, uh, so I, I followed that. I followed that advice. I, I when I first came, I went to see each particular governor. I, I and I asked the people, "You you tell me." So I did not come saying I need to bring them this. Mm. Rather, he said, 
find what that they've already have have such beautiful spirituality, such mm -hmm. great love, mm -hmm. and uh, just be again a servant, love them, and uh, let them write on your blank uh, mm -hmm. blackboard. So what was your so, experience? So it was, it was, that was the best way to do it. I mean, I was very happy. So, I mean, my training then, I felt I was trained by, mm -hmm. by the Pueblo people when, when I went into to Pueblo ministry those many, many mm -hmm. years ago. And I've always been grateful to him for that mm -hmm. advice that, uh, uh, you know, and obviously I've done a fair amount of reading since then, et, et cetera, but, but that my initial formation for that work was, was doing it this way. So that, that affected sacraments and that affected the day-to-day the, the -day mm -hmm. interaction with these people and uh, something that will always stay with me. So Shows the value of obedience. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. <laughs> How about you, Father Gibber? What was your experience? Well, <coughs> I came to the Navajo Reservation as a deacon before I was ordained a priest in 1963, actually, for the summer program of teaching religion. And uh, I was sold on coming back. and. In fact, they had to kind of reprimand me when I went back to school. Say, hey, you got another year here, you know, <laughs> stay with it. And then I uh, asked to come to the Southwest and was assigned in 65 to 92 uh, Laguna, Laguna Pueblo, and I've been here ever since. Mm -hmm. What have you found in terms of the relationship between different Pueblos that have different backgrounds? Because you guys have served in obviously different situations. Um, what, what challenges or what have you learned from the different Indian groups here in this part of the world. Father Melvin has been at so many. Yeah. Every Pueblo is very different, right? Um, like Father Larry says, I think just going in there and listening to them, that's very important to listen to them and just being there for them, no? not trying to force any ideas on them, just be a, a Franciscan for them. I think it makes a big difference that they ex learn to accept you, and <clears throat> once they accept you, they accept some of your values. Um, I've had very good uh, relation with all the Pueblos, all different. Somebody asked you, what, what's your favorite one? There is none that are really favored me. Uh, some treated me a little nicer than others, but um, it depends on the leadership in the Pueblo, the governors, whoever's the governor of the Pueblos. Um, makes a difference in the relationship in the tribe that way. Yeah. But I've always had very fine relationship. How have you found that, that Catholicism <coughs> has affected the Native American culture? Can you speak to that? Father Barnabas, who was the first Franciscan from Cincinnati when the Cincinnati Franciscans took over the missions of the Southwest again, he was at Hamas Pueblo for some 29 years. He was sort of my mentor. He lived in Santa Fe when I was there. And uh, he gave me a lot of advice and information about the Pueblo people. And one thing he says that the, the Pueblo people have what they call a, a different kind of mentality than the Anglo people, the European, that they can put contradictions together and have no trouble at all. They mix oil and water and there's no difficulty. So the Pueblos do that, they can mix two different, what we consider contradictions together, and they have no trouble putting the Catholic faith and the, uh, their Indian re religion together. Just like one man told me, you got a wagon going down from San Jemez to Bernalillo, you've got one horse, you get there, you got two horses, you get there a lot better. So we got the Catholic faith and the uh, Indian religion both pulling the same way, pulls trying to better things for our people. Yeah. But even within our own Christian faith, there are a lot of mysteries that we have to absorb. I mean, if you think about the mystery of the Trinity, that we have to help try to understand and to grasp, how do those kinds of principles uh, mix with, does it actually seem to help if you have a Native American consciousness to uh, be able to absorb or to appreciate uh, such things as the Trinity or other mysteries within Christianity? I, I really believe so. I mean, many of the, the, the Pueblos have um, native gods, which doesn't translate well into um, maybe our concept of, of God. But what they see is that, that God is this loving being who manifests uh, himself in so many different ways and in so many uh, uh, different nuances. And so, you know, God may be the God of the weather, of rain, you know, of snow, and, you know, 
of love and of justice, of, of, and, and they will personify all these, um, uh, these articulations of, of who God is, and it's their way of, of grasping him. So it actually becomes a two-way street. I mean, I, I think you know, Catholicism has, has, has clearly helped us you know, get, get into that particular concept, but it's also helped, helped us from the Native American side, you know, understand the Trinity more as, as uh, you know, it's, it's three persons, it's one God who is manifested in three very unique and separate uh, mm -hmm. uh, ways. Uh, but, the, but the Pueblo people have always seen, you know, this God manifesting himself. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they may call it all these gods, but it's, it's, it's one God. I think one thing the <clears throat> Holy Father, when he came down to Phoenix, on his visitation in 1985, I believe somewhere, he did mention the fact that when he met with the Native American people <clears throat> that they should appreciate their culture because their culture can give a lot to the world through their culture. And he asked them to continue to use their culture and likewise indoctrinated with Christianity. So the Holy Father sort of blessed all the work of the Franciscans years ago. Hmm. I noticed that you fellows chose Our Lady of Guadalupe to be the name and the patroness of this province. Uh, can you talk about that? Obviously the, the history being that she, Our Lady manifested as a Native American woman, and yet she is probably revered more uh, in Hispanic culture than anywhere in the world. But can you talk a little bit about why you chose uh, Our Lady as your patroness or the new, uh, the new head of the province, so to speak? Who would like to take that one? Well, we were dialoguing and discerning about the new province. It was a real process. It took three years of meetings and meetings and meetings and all kinds of stuff. And at one time, when we finally decided to start our own entity, our own province, uh, not any anger at Cincinnati. We're very good friends of Cincinnati. They did an awful lot for us. But we took a vote on what names could come up, and quite a few different names came up. And most of them felt because the lady was, Our Lady of Guadalupe was such an influence in bringing the Mexican people into Christianity. In other words, before Our Lady appeared to Juan Diego, very few Mexican people were Christian. But after Juan Diego, had the image of Our Lady of Guadalupe, about 10, 13, 15 million people became Christians. Um, That's a miracle in and of itself. It, it is, you know, not through the Franciscans, but through the intercession of Our Lady of Guadalupe. So we thought that that's what we need is her influence and her patronage to, again, work miracles to bring uh, the Lord more deeply into all the people of the Southwest, since she did such a good job in Mexico. Uh, but most of those people at that time were Native American, weren't they? I mean, the original Mexicans were, weren't they mostly Native American people? Yeah, right. All Mexicans. Yeah. I mean, yeah, but whatever they were. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Guadalupe does, you know, she is not appearing as a white person. She's no. not a Caucasian, you know. She's, she's not uh, upper crust. She's clearly of the people. She's dark. Uh, Juan Diego is is an Indian, and she is uh, she is clearly a, a native person, mm -hmm. a person of the Americas, mm -hmm. uh, and not of Spain or not of the Western Western world. So it was another reason I think I wasn't here when the province uh, uh, became a province. So but that would I mean I, I just think looking on it when people ask me about it, mm -hmm. I believe I said she certainly represents. Uh, our our thrust here, the new province, is mm -hmm. is towards in the service of Native American peoples and Hispanic peoples. is is kind of our main main thrust. That's great. She's great. Listen, if you've just joined us, uh, we're having a conversation with the three provincials of Our Lady of Guadalupe Province of the Franciscan Order here in the Southwest, primarily in New Mexico and Arizona, and um, we're having a discussion about the history of the province. But I also want to remind you to watch the credits, but be sure and go to their website at www.olgofm, or Our Lady of Guadalupe Franciscan, or if you can't find it, Google it up, the Franciscan province, or Our Lady of Guadalupe province, that's what I found. And they have a lot of information there, and I hope that you'll, if you see anything or hear anything here that makes you interested, that you'll contact them for, for more information, and read some of the wonderful books that uh, Father Crispin brought for us that we'll talk about later, hopefully, on St. Francis and the work that they do. Um, in the few minutes we have remaining, I want you to bring you guys up to, to date and say, 
uh, how are we doing and where are we currently throughout? I mean, you must have any number of uh, locations throughout the Southwest that they're Franciscans serving. Do you know them offhand? Or? We, we certainly do, obviously, and Father Mel and Father Gilbert can speak of the ones in Arizona on the Navajo okay. Reservation over yeah. here. Uh, we, are in, we have a parish in Albuquerque, our parish is in Roswell, Rio Rancho. Um, uh, we are chaplains to the Felician Sisters. Uh, up north, uh, Father Salvador, former rector at the cathedral, is now uh, Pastor Los Ojos in Tierra Maria. Um, we are at Jemez Pueblo, uh, Santa Ana Pueblo, San, um, Azia Pueblo, Santa Clara, Tezuque, San Alfonso, Isleta Pueblo, uh, Laguna, Acoma Pueblo, Zuni Pueblo. Am I missing any? And, uh, and then I'll let well, them. Yeah, they're all on the website, but go <laughs> ahead. Let's see if they can remember. How about you, Father? What do you, in Arizona, where are we? Well, basically, we're on the Navajo Reservation. Uh, St. Michael's is kind of a center. One of, it was the original site. The friars came there in 1898. And that was through the intercession of now St. Catherine Drexel, wasn't it? Right, right. Yes, uh, and she went to Cincinnati and solicited uh, friars to come. So St. Michael's is kind of a center where we're trying to reach out to the other missions that have already been established and continuing that ministry. The, People themselves are becoming much more active in the uh, ministry. We have four native uh, Navajo deacons working on the reservation with us, as well as many sisters' communities, of course. Mm -hmm. Well, in just a couple of minutes, what, what word would you have any young men or women out there that are thinking, perhaps my life would be more meaningful in a religious uh, context, who would like to take the last couple of minutes to say a word for vocations today? Uh, certainly, I, I, I would push that website again, olgofm.org. Uh, it has some excellent information on vocations, those who would like to follow a, a Franciscan way of life and, and, and possibly be with us here in, in this particular province. Um, and you also have secular Franciscans, so you don't have to, you can keep your normal life and be, a, be affiliated or the many volunteers, don't you? One of the geniuses of Francis, that many married people or people who wish to just be single, not religious, wish to though live a Franciscan, live, live Franciscan values. And, and he founded a rule for people who are married or single. So secular Franciscans are still uh, very much a part of the whole Franciscan movement as, as are women religious. So the male religious to women religious and, and lay people, it's, it's, it's really a beautiful thing for, uh, for the Franciscan movement. Yeah, that's true. Well, we've pretty much run out of time. I told you it was going to go by fast and we wouldn't get to everything we'd like to. But I hope you will take uh, these, these fellows, Father Larry, Father Gilbert, and Father Meldon's advice. Go to that website if you can, www.olf... O-L-G. O-L-G, I'm sorry, O-F-M.org. Or if you can't find it, just Google up uh, Our, Lady of, Our, <laughs> Our Lady of Guadalupe Province, which I did last night, and it's a wonderful website. Or the phone number and address will, of the provincial house in Albuquerque will be in the credits. I recommend that you call them. Uh, I'm sure they have vocation directors standing by if there's <laughs> somebody that you'd like to talk to about it. Uh, and I want you to know we miss you here in Santa Fe at the cathedral and we're going to do a future program on that about the history of the Franciscan Cathedral here in New Mexico. We want to thank you very much for coming this long way. Both these guys came from Arizona and Father Larry here from Albuquerque to uh, share with us so I hope that you will keep them in your prayers and remember them uh, when it's time to give some donations to a worthy cause. So on behalf of everybody here at Spirituality TV, I'm Bill O'Donnell. I want to thank you for viewing and stay tuned next week for another program on spirituality. Thank you, Bill. Thank you.
Thank you.